put this for us on um, that that we can actually start there because it is it is it is actually very nice material. Um, uh, Nico, yes. I'm sorry. Did, did you send the link to Quibus? Didn't you? <laughs> I think I forgot. Let me quickly send it to him because I know he wanted to join as well. I'm sending to please, then. Yeah? I'm sending. Okay. Okay, it's just a. We, we're just waiting for another person and Paul. Um, okay, no problem. We, we will be putting this this out as um, again for um, um, that that we are actually going to do it every every Wednesday because it's about a hundred and, and and three pages, so it's a lot of lot of lot of pages that we are going going to be working through, and I don't want to take up too much time of people's day that we can. Kubus is is here. Um, and there's another one here as well. No, we, we are. Kubus, welcome. Welcome, welcome. Okay. So Eden, you will you will be, be handling the the um, the questions. If there's any questions. I'll do that. I'll do that. You will do that. Okay. So this is a um, a course that has been being placed out by the PCB, uh, Pan Pandemic Preparedness and Response, the the introduction to this, and and I think this is this is fairly applicable on on what we are doing now, what we are going through with COVID, and um, I don't think that that we could have done this prior to um, to this period that people are starting to be going back to work, back to school, back back to back to places. So. I'm, I'm just going to go through the, the introduction here. Um, Paul has already um, seen the PCB's um, training material, but Quibus hasn't. So um, for the sake of, of Quibus, um, I just want to make sure that, that you are getting the gist of, of how the PCB is actually developing the training material. So the schedule for, for the training course is firstly se section one. Uh, the training course objectives and structure. Section two will be pandemic and the impact. Section three is preparing for a pandemic. Section four is responding to a, a pandemic. Five is, is communicating during a pandemic. And six, um, closing of the training course itself. Now, if you're looking at, at uh, the references that we are going to be using, firstly, we are going to be using ISO 22300. Um, that is the business continuity um, vocabulary. Uh, we are also using um, ISO 22301. That is the new business continuity standard that has been issued last year. ISO 22313 of 2020. That is business continuity management system guidance to, um, to the use of ISO 22301. And this is a fairly nice one. And then ISO 22316 is organizational resilience principles and attributes. And then we are going to, to, to just glance through ISO 70, 17012, 17024, and 17065. This is, this is actually the conformity um, assessment that the PCB and the, the certification bodies has to comply with. The list of acronyms, we are going to be speaking here of, this, of BCM, that's Business Continuity Management. BCP is Business Continuity Plan. CDC is the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. COVID-19 is the coronavirus disease of, of 2019. Um, GDP is the, the gross domestic product. ILO is International Labor Organization. ISO, um, I think all of us know that one. PCB, we, we know that one as well. SARS is not um, our revenue services. It is the Severe Ac Acute Respiratory Syndrome. VPN is Virtual Private Network, and WHO is World Health Organization. And this is the, the kind of, um, of acronyms, ac acronyms which will be used um, in, in this training course. Meet and greet. Um, I'm going to give us um, a quick um, chance just, to, just for us to meet and greet and to say who we are and that, that everybody knows 
um, what is your name, your current position, knowledge um, and your experience and your training course expectations. So can we start with um, with them for them? And then we can go over to Kurbas and then Elian, and then I will proceed. Hello, uh, my name is Mpo. I'm in, in Botswana uh, with with Debswana. Um, as, as, as head of security and um, have had exposure to uh, various training courses uh, with CAA, um, um, ISO training, um, the state 1000, the risk management training, uh, where we, we did the lead, uh, lead implementer uh, training, also the lead auditor with 18788. And, um, and I think uh, that's where the future lies. And uh, it's an exciting journey to be uh, a part of, being a part of the alumni. And as we, as we evolve, seeing even more exciting things which are preparing us not only for the response to um, the current uh, COVID, but also getting ready for pandemics in, in general uh, as we evolve into the future. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you very much. Kubis? Yes, I'm coming out of the mining industry. Uh, yes, and trying my best to help everybody uh, with COVID and to trying to adapt to the new way of living and to helping everybody to getting ahead of the game and uh, seeing what we can get out of it. Okay, and Kubis, you are a mechanical engineer. Mechanical engineer, uh, GCC, okay. and yeah, uh, businessman. 100%. Thank you very much, Julian. Hello, yeah, I think everybody knows me. I'm Julian Blom, um, executive associate of uh, Crest Advisory Africa. Um, did all these tra ISO trainings and am a trainer. And yeah, and I think that. Um, I think our whole view has changed um, with this um, COVID, um, but for me, it's a new reality. Um, it's a new way of doing things. And um, I'm actually, I'm, 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 I'm not scared of the future. I think we've, we've, the, um, things are changing, but um, change is the only thing that we can be certain of. So we, let's do this, we, let's change. Absolutely, thank you, Lian. Thank you, Paul, thank you, Kubis. Uh, just some, some general information for the, for the, um, the duration of, of this training. Um, firstly, the use of smartphones and recording devices. I am recording um, this, so don't worry about it. We will send it afterwards. Secondly, your smartphones, if you can, if you can put it on silence, um, I see that you have muted your, um, your microphones. Thank you for that. Secondly, um, please put up your hand. I think there's, a, there's somewhere there with a chat or raising your hand somewhere you can you can either chat. Elian will be will be monitoring that. Um, firstly, and then secondly, I think there's also a place where you can can put up your your hand that 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 we can see that you have got something to say there. Please, this is not for me a training session that 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 it is a lecture that I'm I am giving to you. I want actually for us to be discussing things um, around pandemics and um, actually around business continuity. Third thing, use of computers and access to the internet. Make sure that your access to your, your internet is, is stable. If, if we don't have to use video, um, then we can switch it off. Even mine, I don't have a problem with that. Um, the schedule and absen absences. Um, if we are taking breaks, I, I want to see how far can we, can we actually get within an hour or maybe an, an, an hour and a half. I think it is a bit too much um, for us now at the moment to do all 103 pages. It is going to take the whole day. So um, if you are happy with it, um, we, we can, we can, um, we are recording this. So we will, we will have it um, from page so and so to page X, Y, and Z. So I would love us to be finished by about 11 o'clock. If it's okay with you, Paul, Kubis. Yeah, no, I'm okay with it. Yep. Is okay with you. Okay. Um, then no then we can we can we can we can do it again next week. We will have a weekly a weekly session. So so um, so so we've got two hours, two hours, two hours, and we will have it finished 
um, in three weeks. And then meals and breaks. Um, if you want to break um, on the hour, I think that, that that would be actually good for us, that we can just pause, have a five minute break, break and, and um, a domestic break, have some coffee, have some water, and um, then we can go on. And then customer service, um, please, we are here to serve you. And you can see that in this, in this whole process, customer service, to ensure customer service and, and um, customer service satisfaction and continue improvement, the PSB customer service has established a support ticket system for handling complaints. So please, if there's any, anything that you, that, that, that you want us to help you with, please ask us. We are actually very, very close to you. So we can, we can work with you on that. The learning objectives that we've got here are two definite things. Firstly, uh, what, what kind of skills are we looking, looking out um, for acquiring? The first one is getting acquainted with the main concepts of, of pandemic preparedness and response. And the second one is understand the basic elements of a business continuity plan and how to respond to pandemics. And I think this is very applicable because if we're looking at, at um, I, I think personally that business continuity plans ha has been, has been um, for the last four months since COVID has been, been impl uh, um, implemented and the, and the world went into lockdown, I think it has turned business continuity plans on its head. Um, we are looking usually when we are developing business continuity plans, what is the effect of a, of a, um, um, a power interruption? What's the effect of a water interruption? What is the effect of, of um, a bomb scare, et cetera? But pandemics, because we didn't have a pandemic that, that was so, um, so, so strong and so fierce as COVID-19, we, we had SARS and, and, and all the others, but um, it is not like COVID-19, um, sorry, COVID-19. And that is going to change business continuity plans tremendously. So if you're looking at knowledge, skills, and behavior, the knowledge, if we're looking at, at, at competence, Quibus, you, you, you were not um, involved in, in, this, in this prior. We are looking at no. this competence. We, we're looking at this, at this meaning of competence, of actually having four different sections. The, the first one is knowledge. You are building knowledge, you're having knowledge, you've got experience, you've got a qualification, etc. Then we are speaking about skills. Skills has to do with, um, do you have presentation skills? Do you have communication skills? Do you have cognitive skills? Do you have technical skills? Now, we, we have got a, a, a fantastic program that is actually, actually looking at what is the behavioral skills of people. Um, so skills are very important. And then behavior. Behavior is your attitude. If your attitude is bad, it doesn't have, it, it doesn't help you to have knowledge and skills um, because we cannot work with you. And the last one, number four, that, that we can just make, make a note of there is actually context. If you are a professor in a university and you are knowledgeable um, and you are knowledgeable about um, business continuity, but you don't have the, the, the practical experience in the context of banking services, with with and mining services with all the intricate programming and intricate um, contextual environmental knowledge you don't have uh, um, you are not you are not competent you can be academically competent but um, those four are are actually making making for yourself here a huge um, um, I want to say it is, it is creating for you a component by component and each component is actually addressing the next one. So those, those four is actually making you competent. People, people are speaking about competence as that I'm, I am competent. Really? How did you measure it? On knowledge, skills, behavior, and do you know the context of the organization? If you don't know that, you are not competent. So if you're looking at the PCB, just, just for um, quickly, the PCB is a certification body which provides education and certification for persons, management systems, and products on a wider range of internal stand, um, international standards. 
and the PCD offers certification for management systems, persons for training courses, for applications, teams, and it is also a university. So it has grown tremendously over the last, um, since, since I've been with them uh, in 2017. And if we're looking at the, the certification bodies, um, the certification bodies like the ISO, they are certifying um, the PCB and, and others now as well in ISO 17024 that, that contains the requirements for bodies uh, for the certification of persons, um, 17021 1 specific requirements for, for competence, consistency, and impartiality of uh, bodies providing audit and certification of management systems. Now, this is where the management system certificate is, is at the entrance of a company, and they are saying that their ISO 9001, 45000, et cetera, certified. And then ISO 17065 contains requirements for the competence, consistency, and impartiality of body certifying products, processes, and services. And then PCB is accredited by the International Accreditation Service, the IAS, and you can go to the IAS, the website is iasonline.org, um, and you will find um, the PCB with all the, the accreditation and, and all the approvals that is there. So that is fairly straightforward. Um, if you're looking at, so are the questions so far? Any questions? You can just- oh, from me, thank you. Yep, straightforward. No, um, you can, well. you can, I think there's a, you can, you can have a, a thumbs up or, or something. Elin, show us that, that one. Ah, there you are. So thank you very much for that one, Elian. And thank you for, for, the, for the feedback. Section two. Section two is speaking about pandemics and their impacts. So we're going to look here at firstly, infectious diseases. What is a pandemic? Definitions, modes of disease um, transmissions, the characteristics of pandemic pathogens, economic, social, and political impact of the pandemic, and what is preparedness, business continuity, and business continuity principles. So section two is actually a mouthful. So if you're looking at, at section two, infectious diseases um, are diseases that can spread directly or indirectly from one, one individual to another. Typically, they are caused by pathogen microorganisms such as viruses, bacteria, fungi, or parasites. The diseases uh, that can be transmitted um, from animals to humans are called zoonotic um, diseases and there's some examples of this. F firstly, sepsis, hepatitis A, B, C, and D, influenza, uh, malaria, smallpox. Um, we can have the influenza um, that is on a seasonal basis as well, measles, tuberculosis, cholera, HIV, AIDS, uh, the plague, um, um, pneumonia, and animal bites. And I think if, if we're looking at COVID 19, um, and also if we're looking at at um, H1, um, H1N2, in, in that, that was all was actually coming from, um, from bats that, 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 that caused this. So what is a pandemic? A pandemic is described as an infection that spreads globally and has a high morbidity and mortality rate. The word pandemic derives from the Greek word pandemos, where pan means across and demos uh, means people or, po or population. That's fairly nice. According to the, the World Health Organization, a pandemic is declared when a new disease from which people do not have immunity spreads around the world beyond the expectations. And this is exactly what has happened with, with COVID-19. I think we, we, we are, we are not, not only living history, we are also making history in, in our resilience to this um, um, this virus. So there's a few terms and definitions. So firstly, the index, um, index case and patient zero refer to the, to the first person infected with a pathogen. The pathogen refers to the bacteria, viruses, or other microorganisms that cause the disease. And a reservoir refers to the environment, plant, or animal in which a disease can manage to survive for an, for an um, extended period. 
and then the spillover or pathogen spillover refers to the action of transmitting the disease from one species to another and then vector means um, refers to an organ organism that does not cause the disease but passes pathogens from one host to another causing an infection and we can see the this is also with malaria um, and those those kind of things terms and conditions uh, terms and definitions sorry um, are not or the factor are, are not and then incubation period and as asymptomatic transmissions firstly are not what does it mean this refers to the the reproduction number of the disease i um for an example how contagious an infection uh, infectious disease is now if you're looking at r naught r naught is actually um, patient zero and actually the 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 contagiousness of of um of how many people is that is that one person infecting now if we're looking at um what has happened in New York and across the globe and Italy and Spain, etc. R was at the at at um, at the height of COVID. It was close to three R R three. So this means that one person is actually infecting three other people. Those three other people are actually infecting three other 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 people. So now we are sitting already with uh, three nine um, three six nine. We're sitting with twelve people. Those twelve people are um, are infecting three other people. So now with, we are sitting with 36 and those 36 are infecting three other people. So immediately your transmission rate is actually uh, accumulating so fast that, that, that you, you, you don't have firstly the means of detecting it, secondly the means to manage it, and thirdly um, the, 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 the process of, of actually getting a vaccination for it is so is so uh, um, is so slow compared to the spread of the virus that your R naught factor is critical for you to understand and to always have a have a full understanding of what is the R naught incubation period. We are speaking here of um, it refers to the time period between exposures to to a pathogen and the manifestation of the first symptoms. Now, if you're looking at COVID-19, we were. Um, this is why people were quarantined for 14 days, or well, or self-quarantined for 14 days, because the moment that that you are exposed to the virus, um, within about five to seven days, you are starting to show symptoms, and then you are starting to be sick. So, um, the reason for the 14 days is actually to make sure that that within those 14 days, if you didn't show any um, symptoms within those 14 days, you are, you, you are, you are actually fairly, fairly, um, fairly safe because it should have been uh, within the five to, to seven day period where you should have um, showed some, some symptoms. And then we've got asymptomatic transition. This is where you don't have any symptoms, but you are still transmitting the disease. And this is where they are saying that children are most of the time asymptomatic. They have got the disease, um, but they don't get, get sick. Uh, but if you are putting them out into a crowd, they are actually infecting other people. So this refers to the transmission of the, the disease from an individual that shows no signs or symptoms of the disease, but has been infected and is in fact contagious. Very critical there. And it is not only that that one is one is um, looking at people that is sick. You can also get it from from people that is actually not sick at all. Um, so, what is the the difference between seasonal flu versus pandemic flu? So, seasonal flu, the the normal cold and the normal flu that we are getting injections for, etc., is firstly it uh, outbreaks follow a predictable seasonal pattern. The population has immunity because of previous exposure. Sensitive, sensitive groups are, are usually at increased risk for serious complications. The health system can meet the needs of the public and antiviral medication are usually available. A vaccine already exists. 
Symptoms are, are more common, such as um, cough and runny nose, and deaths are often caused by complications. And then seasonal flu has a modest impact on society, such as, uh, um, such as encouragement of people who are sick to, to stay home. And the impact of domestic uh, and worldwide economy is manageable. So th this is actually in the normal pattern, in the normal biorhythm of the world, every environment are getting seasonal flu. And this is usually at the onset um, going from, from, um, from summer into, into autumn, as well as from winter into, into spring, that you are getting seasonal flu because of the environment that is changing. Pandemic flu, on the other hand, is pandemic flu occurs rarely. So it is actually, if we're talking about um, risk management, we are speaking here of, of this is a black swan event. Um, the population has little to, to no pre-existing um, immunity. So it is totally different than your seasonal flu. The entire population may be at, at increased risk for serious complications. So all of us are at risk. Um, during, during last week, um, one, of, one of the radio commentators was asking, have you prepared yourself that you are going to get COVID-19? Because it is inevitable that you are going, going to be getting it. Because we are getting in, into contact with so many people, um, whether it is just two or three that is working in your house, they, they, have, they have used a taxi, um, and in the taxi there were 13, 14 other people that are touching, that is coming from different environments. And then the health system is, is most likely overwhelmed and effective antiviral medication are unavailable or limited. And then a vaccine does not exist yet. Several symptoms and complications appear more frequently. And then the pandemic flu has major impacts on society, such as closing of schools and businesses, restriction on travel, cancellations, cancellation of events, etc., And the impact on domestic and world economy is severe. We have seen that, we are seeing it. It is, it is, at, the, um, it is at the moment a living, a living um, exercise that we are going through. So the methods for disease transmission. So we've got here different classifications for, method, uh, for methods of disease transmission, which include firstly, direct transmission, indirect transmission, and then vector transmission. So direct transmission is person to person. When we are touching a person, et cetera, we're talking about droplets. I think we, we know um, in terms of COVID, droplets is the biggest um, challenge that we are sitting with because a, a, a droplet, whether you are coughing, sneezing, that droplet can actually um, travel for three, four, five meters um, and and um, and you are thinking that you are safe in two meters um, from another person. Indirect, we are we we are talking here about fecal oral, and then airborne, and then vectors. Vectors is four mites, and um, the insect bites that we that we are speaking speaking of. Now each of these uh, are actually discussed here at the bottom. So person to person. Um, where an infected person through, through touch or the exchange of body fluids with another person spreads the disease. For example, kissing can be uh, one way of person-to-person -person transmissions. A pregnant mother can also pass a disease to, on, onto her unborn child. Now, this is prevalent in HIV AIDS. We have seen that droplets where an infected person spreads in, in infectious droplets by sneezing or coughing that land on nearby people. And then diseases that, that, that can be spread um, even without direct contact is in two ways, fecal oral transmissions, where microscopic amounts of pathogens are transmitted from an infected person's feces to, other, um, to another person by mouth. And you can see the, the examples there of, um, of, of washing rooms. Um, this is why um, restrooms is, is for me, toilets are for me actually, and public toilets are actually the worst place to be. If you touch anything there, a door handle, you don't know who has actually touched that, that space prior to you. 
and then airborne transmissions. We are speaking here where infectious agents enter the air and remain there for some time when an infected person sneezes, coughs and laughs. Uh, when an individual uh, comes into contact with the agent, the individual becomes ill. And then formite um, transmissions means that an, an infectious disease is passed through an um, inanimate object or formite to a healthy person. An example of, of this is use, uh, use of shared computer keyboards that act as a vehicle to transfer the disease from an infected person to a healthy person. And then it's a insect bite uh, means that uh, the disease is spread when an, when an insect bites a person like in malaria um, and in those, in those areas. And this is also very really nice if you're looking at the National Geographic Media Methods Disease Transmission. If you, if, um, if you have got the documentation, you can click on that and you can go ahead and you, you've got all the information on that. The characteristics of pandemic pathogens. So firstly, we are talking about pathogens that cause a pandemic usually um, possess, possesses a few attributes uh, that in combination cause a sudden widespread disaster beyond the, the collective capability of national and international bodies of control. And the traits are, are as follows, modes of transmission, the timing of the transmission, the host uh, population factors, and then the, intrins the intrinsic uh, micro, uh, microbial characteristics that you've got there. So um, each of each of those, uh, if looking at the modes of transmission, each mode of transmission has the capability, the capacity to cause large outbreaks if left unchecked. And if you're looking at the timing of the transmission, the pathogen onsets. Um, and duration in the period when a person is contagious during an, an, an infection plays a major role in the global spread of the disease. And so there's, there's two, and then those population factors and um, the intrinsic microbial um, characteristics, there is a close connection between host characteristics and microbial pathogenity. And if, if we're looking at the micropaths, has to be has to affect a large amount of world population in forms that have to uh, that have no known cure to create a pandemic disease and this is where we are we are sitting here with um, with COVID-19 in exactly in the same space if you're looking at economic social and political impact of the pandemic now if you're looking at at this before you you will you will now recognize it and Elian as well as this is actually our external context analysis within risk management. So within risk management, we are talking about the PESTEL model. Um, PESTEL is your, the political, economical, social, technical, um, environmental, and your legal environment. And if you're looking, looking at this, you can actually e expand it to the whole of PESTEL. You don't have to to only stick with economical, social, and political impact, because it is actually environmental as well. It is actually legal as well, because every legal, um, every legal decision that is being being made um, is coming in into the COVID nineteen legal environment, and that is making up what you need to, to comply with. So, economic is according to the, the World Bank a severe pandemic and result in millions of deaths. And even the most conservative estimates suggest that, that pandemics destroy up to 1% of global gross domestic product, GDP. Now, I think if we're looking at the economic environment, if we're looking at just America, America has, has actually, in the first two months of the pandemic, they've lost about 45 million um, jobs. They are standing now at, at about 20 million 20 to 25 million uh, jobs back, but they have lost about 20 million jobs at the moment. So um, that is huge, huge. They are sitting on, on an employment figure of 13 to 17% um, of the whole population. That is huge. The social impact is extensive public panic. We have seen that with, with panic buying, with, with everything we, we, have, we have actually seen that more with people that is 
um, that is um, deprived of, of liquor and, and um, cigarettes and those kind of things, population migration, increased stigmatization and increased blame of minority populations for the disease. And it was, it was interesting when, when this disease um, uh, was, was actually starting to, um, to spread the end of February, beginning of March. I, I, I just came back. Um, I arrived the 12th of, um, of March. Um, I, I arrived back from Ethiopia and um, at the airport um, when, when, when we were going through the airport um, screening processes, um, the people at the airport were saying uh, that, you know what, white people, and this is not a racist thing, white people are, are more susceptible to this based on the, the current scientific information that um, in Italy, in Spain, that Italy has closed down at that time, the whole country. Um, Spain, um, fairly the same, that it was, it was going over in, into, into England where people are thinking that England is white and they are not actually. And then going over into, into the Americas um, where the first people that was, actually, that was actually getting it were white people. So they were saying that, that, that this is actually a white man's disease. It is not. It is everybody. We can now, um, three months later, with all the numbers on the table, we, we, can, we can see that, that certain populations are more susceptible to this and certain um, age groups as well. Definitely, definitely 60 and upwards. Um, uh, those are the vulnerable groups as well as people with, 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 um, with illnesses, underlying chronic illnesses um, that is affecting that. The political impact is amplified existing political tension and unrest. And we can see, we could have seen this with our, with our currency. Firstly, our currency um, um, was, was actually in South Africa, we were actually lucky because we, we were downgraded um, to um, a rubbish status just before COVID and, and, and it had actually uh, that status had, had actually no impact um, on our economy. It was actually a bigger impact that we've got with, um, with how prepared are we, what is actually happening in the global market, what is actually happening in, in, um, in, in how do we prepare um, for the pandemic, etc. And the political impact, if you're looking at, at America, it is for me a, um, a fantastic example now at the moment. The trust in the president has actually been totally lost. So um, Trump is sitting with, with a re-election that, that is coming up. And, and uh, the question is, did he manage the COVID-19 process correctly, firstly? And secondly, did he actually um, manage uh, um, the, the police reform and the violence, uh, the use of force by the police, did he manage that correctly? Now, if you're looking at some notable epidemics and pandemics, in 2003, the SARS pandemic um, was announced. The, the geographical extent was in four continents and, th and 37 countries. And the estimated direct morbidity or mortality rate was 8,098 8, um, 8 possible cases uh, and there were 744 deaths. And the estimated economic, social and political impact was the GDP loss of, U, of, US, um, of 4 billion US dollars in Hong Kong. Um, in China, it was 3 billion to 6 billion um, in, in Canada and 5 billion in Singapore. That is huge amounts of money. If you're looking at 2009, all of us remember the swine flu. Um, that, was, that was globally in, in this one. Um, we were speaking about um, 
151, 700 to 575, 500 deaths. So that was 0 0.2 to 0 0.8 per 10,000 persons. And the, the, the GDP loss in the United States was 1 billion um, in, in the Republic of Korea. Um, and then if looking at, um, at MERS, that was in 2012, 22 countries, uh, 1879 1, symptomatic cases. And, and you can see how deadly was this disease, um, 659 deaths. And, and then the economic impact of this one was uh, in, in Korea, about um, 2 billion US dollars, triggering 14 billion in government stimulus spending. And if you go over to 2014, West Africa Ebola uh, virus, that was, uh, the extent of that was in 10 countries. Uh, there were 28,646 cases and 11,000 deaths. And it had uh, an effect of 2 billion um, loss in Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone. Um, and if you're looking at the Zika virus in 2015, 76 countries, and we were sitting there on, on 2656 reported cases. Um, and then we're looking here at um, 7 billion to 18 billion US dollars lost in Latin America and the Caribbean. So you can see the, the epidemics and what is actually happen, happening in COVID, where we are standing now at the moment over 8 million um, infected. Um, I think we are, we are standing close to half a million uh, people already dead. Um, so this is having, and if you're looking at all the, the financial stimulus, that was actually um, announced across the world. That is just huge. So what, what is pre preparedness? The United Nations and the World Health Organization define preparedness as the ability, the, the ability, and, and this is very important measurables. It is knowledge, capacities, and organizational systems of governments, professional response organizations, communities, and individuals to anticipate, detect, and respond effectively to and recover from the impact of likely imminent or current health emergencies, hazards, events, or conditions. It means putting in place mechanisms that will allow national authorities, multilateral organizations, and relief organizations to be aware of risks and deploy staff and resources quickly once a crisis strikes. Now, preparedness in in this in this space means that what you need to have the budget you need to have um, the capacity of people you you need to have the skills the competencies um, and everything and even testing kits and and all those kind of things we have we have seen this flurry of um, the need for for um, kn 95 um, masks we have seen for um, for other PPE things now as well, um, tools uh, as well. We've seen for, for respirators, um, for hospital beds, especially in New York, as well as in Italy. In New York, they, they, they were um, from the National Guard, they were actually building um, in, in the National Convention Center um, in New York, they were building a two and a half thousand bed um, ICU where they can actually have people to be to be placed there, and you can you can see this. This is this is fairly fairly recent information. We can see the this is this is um, assessed uh, on March the twenty third of of twenty twenty. So this this course is actually a brand brand new course that we that we we um, we are providing. So organizational resilience. What is the meaning of resilience? Firstly, if you're looking at, at uh, the definition of, of resilience in clause um, in, in ISO 22316, that is clause 3.4, resilience is the ability of an organization to absorb and adapt in a changing environment. So very important what we are seeing there is that can you as absorb the pressures and the changes that um, we were as a company for Crest, we had four big contracts prior to, 
to, or, or sorry, not we had, we have. We have four big contracts that, that, that can last us for the whole year. With COVID-19, the biggest organizations in the world with, with an, a deployment in 243 different, different territories globally, they have stopped their payment immediately. Toof. They have said to us, when, when, when the lockdown happened, they had um, a Zoom call with us and they said to us, guys, um, we, are, we are in the liquor business. We cannot, we, there's no liquor sales in the world globally. Everybody has stopped the sale of liquor. So we don't know where we are going to be in a month or two months or three months. We need to get, we need to actually identify, and this is back again to business continuity. Um, we need to identify what is our critical processes now? What is our, our critical resources? What is our, our critical um, um, people that we need to have? Um, and based on that, can you absorb this, this crisis to give us time for three months um, that we can pay you in June or July? And this happened with three or four, co four companies. The other contract that we've got was actually a contract that, that we have implemented in, in, um, in Zimbabwe. Um, and um, when um, the borders was, was closed with the announcement on the 15th of March, we had to, to actually, we, we, we were actually standing and working in, um, in that, that country. We had to get back. We had to get our resources back here. So can you, can you, uh, can you work with, uh, can you absorb and adapt in the changing environment? Adaption, adaption is actually the biggest critical, I want to say mental change that one has to, has to, has to do. You can either accept the pandemic and just sit down and wait for this, this thing to be playing out, whether it is in, in three months, six months, eight months, 10 months, 12 months, or you can do something that you are actually reinventing your company, that you are that you are reinventing your way of doing business, um, that that you are actually changing with the environment. So it is important for organizations to be able to adapt to business environments during a pandemic, considering the pandemics can last for relatively long periods of time. Now, uh, COVID, there's not for us a um, a solution or a vaccine in, a, in the next year? Definitely not. So if you're looking at resilience and organizations resilience, um, I'm going to go, th go through from A to G, is firstly A, is enhanced when behavior is aligned with a shared vision and purpose. So this is where, where we need to, to be looking at, although the, the, um, the companies were closed, do we have a shared vision and purpose there? Secondly, it relies upon an up-to-date understanding of the organization context. How important is the context analysis? How important is the context analysis within, if, if we're looking at ISO, ISO has got clause four. Clause four is actually speaking about understanding of your context. Understanding of your context is actually saying that how strong is my internal context? How strong is and my culture? How strong is my external context and the culture there? My legal context, my permit context. If we're looking at the airlines, I would say about 80% of all the airlines has actually nosedived. They are sitting with, with challenges. Can they restart? Are they in liquidation? Do, are, they, are, they, are they asking for government's help? Um, and then further, um, landing rights landing rights in your in your external environment and this is where akeo and 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 all these companies are coming coming in you are paying for landing rights um in every country so if you are paying for the landing right and you are guaranteed that landing right you can actually put that into your schedule and you know that i've got a landing right in that country and um based on that and landing rights at Heathrow, landing rights at um, Charles de Gaulle in France, landing rights at um, Schiphol in Holland, in, in, um, 
in Frankfurt and all those places, Los Angeles, um, they are costly. And if you don't have the money to actually guarantee for you those landing rights, then you're going to sit after this opening um, of the economy with a big challenge to say that when do we actually fly? Uh, do we have our schedule? If you don't have money, you cannot do that. C is it relies upon an ability to absorb, adapt, and effectively respond to change. Now, you will you will see that um, if you're, if you're looking at at um, at this one, this is the the biggest challenge is change. How can you respond to change, and how willing are you to actually change? Because if you're looking at the um, all of us has got a, a challenge with, with change where we want to be in, in a comfortable environment. We, we want to be in, in, a, in, in an environment where we are predicting what is going to happen. And um, in this space of resilience, you don't have that, that um, I want to say that luxury. You don't have that. D, it relies upon good governance and management. And this is where, if we're looking at um, at businesses that is now surviving, I I, I have seen I've been following um, uh, various channels, um, various news channels globally, and and uh, I I have seen that from your biggest organizations, that is actually your airline organizations that has got a huge amount of of um, I want to say money, they could not stand, they, they, the risk bearing capacity, the RBC, risk bearing capacity, they don't have money in the bank to actually um, stand for two to three weeks, not even a month. After a month, SAA fell, SAA Express fell, uh, you can go on the internet, we are, we are speaking about um, uh, big, um, big international um, airlines that has that has actually fallen because risk management did not make provision for the risk bearing capacity to actually last for three, four to six months. If you're going to to section E, they is supported by a, a diversity of skills, leadership, knowledge, and experience. Very important thing. It is back again to to the competency. Because many of the companies has actually has actually gone into into a restructuring process to say that do we really need so many people? Do we really need that specific skill or not? In in and and what is if we're looking going back to 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 D, what is our business model going to be going forward? Are we going to have shops if we're looking at Starbucks? Starbucks has already indicated that, that they are closing down 400 stores globally. And they are, just op they are opening 300 new ones, but not for people to sit um, in their spaces, just for takeaways. So that is making a huge impact on the whole business model. If, we, if we're looking at, um, at companies that has been 65 years, years old, uh, that has got um, clothing companies, clothing lines, etc. Um, some of them filed for 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 liquidation in March because of there's suddenly an online shopping spree that that is happening there, um, and and that needs to be, and they were they were not geared towards that. They were not looking, um, they were not looking at at any of the changes uh, that could happen. And then F is enhanced by cooperation across management disciplines and contributes from technical and scientific areas of expertise. I think that one is um, coming out of DE and then F and then G is relies upon effectively managing risk. Now everything here, G is actually for me the first one because if you are looking at the risk. The risk is actually looking at B, where you, are, where you are looking at understanding of your organization. How do you mitigate it? How do you show leadership? How do you show tone at the top in this period of, of time? 
So if you go to business continuity, what is business continuity? So clause 3.3 indicates um, of ISO 22301, it says business continuity, capability of an organization to continue the delivery of products and services within acceptable time frames at predefined capacity during a disruption. That is so nice because we're talking here about products and services. We are not only talking about products. Products and services um, is actually aligned. If you're looking at products and services, you will see that ISO 9001 is extremely strong on this. It is speaking about your products and, and there's a model that you can actually go and use to evaluate the, the product um, service, uh, sorry, the product quality assessment in services, you can you can use this this there's a um, a methodology surf qual um, service quality you can you can make a note there surf qual s e r v um, qual uh, um, it's it's q u q u a l and that was actually um, written in the in the late eighties by um, Parasurman Zaitalam and Berry and they were actually eva evaluating um, the service quality and they are the world leaders actually on service quality and within acceptable time frames now if you're looking at i i, I did a, a presentation about three weeks ago um, to one of the mining groups um, globally and the except um, the acceptable time frames if we are looking at anything that you are buying now the moment from from china your time frame of a week delivery is actually double that. So if your time frame was on, on bearings for six months, it is going to be 12 months. If your time frame for ventilators was a month, it's going to be two months. So you can immediately look at your supply chain and, and determine, but what is my time frames and can I work with that? Because risk is now speaking about what is the availability of my, of my critical spares? What is the availab availability of anything that is critical to my business? Do I have, and the current framework that you are working in to say that your alert system is actually when you are going to 10% to of, your, of your total stock count that, that you are actually taking that 10% and, and you are increasing that by 20% uh, with another 10% because your lead time is going to make that, that you are going to, to sit a month without critical space if you don't plan it right now. And this is what we, what we were speaking to, um, to this mining, I want to say conglomerate, because each and every, every um, line item that you've got that is critical, there needs to be a risk bearing capacity assessment conducted on, on that line item to determine um, where, where is it coming from? If it's if your total pool of um, of supply is coming from one single country um, like China, you are going to sit with a challenge because um, if they are closing down, the they are affecting the global com community totally. So under the yellow line, there business continuity management allows organizations to restore their operations following a disruption, which can range from a simple power outage to a major natural disaster, such as a hurricane. And BCM involves a set of processes for an organization to prepare for, respond to, and recover from adverse um, circumstances. All right, disruption. So if you're looking at disruption, and disruption is, is also described in, uh, in 18788, we did a search on that one, um, if you do a search on ISO 18788, it, it is giving you a disruption and uh, unwanted events. I think 78 times it is mentioned in a standard. So disruption is in clause 3.10 of, of ISO 22301. It provides there an incident, whether anticipated or unanticipated, that causes an unplanned negative deviation from the expected delivery of, pro of products and services according to an organization's objectives. Very important. I just want to 
to repeat that again. So it's an incident, whether anticipated or unanticipated, that causes an unplanned negative deviation from the expected delivery of products and services according to our organization's objectives. Very important. So we're looking here at disruptions is reflecting the organization's cash flow. That cash flow, I want to say cash flow firstly, if you don't get revenue, how long is your risk bearing capacity in terms of cash flow? Three months, four months, five months? How long can you survive? What is your resilience in terms of your cash flow? How long can you actually have people working in your environment without any revenue coming in because the global economy is, is standing still? Then your revenue. What is your, your revenue streams? Are we looking at, um, if, you, if you were just like us, um, as Chris, we, we, we were, most of, mo most of our services, the revenue streams that, that we've got there was face-to-face. -face. It is face-to-face -face consultation. It, it was face-to-face -face training. It was face-to-face -face auditing. It is face-to-face -face events. It's face-to-face -face exams. It's everything is face-to-face. -face. Now, in the COVID time, we cannot work face to face. So suddenly all those six or seven revenue streams that you've got is actually null and void. You don't have anything there anymore. Nothing, 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 nothing. So the effect of that revenue streams is an, uh, it's a huge effect on your cash flow. And if you don't have cash flow, you cannot pay your costs. You cannot pay, pay your suppliers. You cannot pay any, anybody that is actually in your value chain. And then the question is, what is your ability to raise capital? Because now you have to go into debt. Now you have to go to the bank and say to the bank, in this time, I don't have money, but I don't know when COVID-19 is going to be over. So can you give me money? But I, I don't know for how long. And I will start paying you back when I can. And that is a bad position to be in. So business continuity principles we're looking here at, at the principles of uh, effective business continuity management which include firstly what is top management's responsibility second one the readiness for major operational disruptions are you ready for that can you can you survive at 50 percent of your of your um of your production output can you survive like the liquor environment that has got absolutely, and the tobacco environment, that has absolutely no sales globally, absolutely none. Um, can you survive? And can you survive in the whole value chain? Not only as a producer of, of, um, of whiskey or anything, but also the man here on the corner that is having a liquor store. Can he survive in his, um, in his business to make sure that that is ready for operational disruptions. And then communication. Wow, communication is critical. We have seen all the, all the um, I want to say, all the disastrous communication from, uh, from Donald Trump. Um, uh, even the, the, the injection of uh, disinfectants into your body, um, that, that is totally uh, you need to make sure that if you are communicating um, that, that, that everything that you are communicating with um, and what you are saying and who is actually saying it um, is critical. In our own environment, we, we, have, we have seen that, um, that certain people of our parliament can speak to, to, to the audience. Other people can absolutely not speak to the, to the audience. Um, and because of that, um, they, they had to reshuffle the communication process and the feedback on a daily basis to say that, what are we doing and how are we doing that? And, um, and that the communication that is going through is clear, concise, and it is actually giving people trust in the whole system. And then testing. How do you test and how do you e conduct exercises um, in the business continuity environment? Because everything that you are actually doing need to be tested. 
if you have got a crisis management committee that is sitting with this communication, then the question is, how are you, are you actually um, testing the communication that, that you are sending out? How are you testing the message that you are sending out? How are you keeping record of the best practices and the feedback in the communication that you are sending out? Are there any questions? This is on section two. Thumbs up if you don't have any questions or thumbs down if you want to have any questions. Thanks, Elian. Okay. Can we proceed? I, I, can we just pause quickly for, for two minutes? I, um, I just want to, let us have a body break, get some water, and then it is now uh, 10.08. Can we be, be back at, um, at 10, um, 12, if it's possible? It's okay. 100%. Thank you. So I'm just going to, to pause um, our recording. Okay, are we ready? Hands up, please. Yes, I'm ready. Thanks, and Paul. And Kubus is ready, and Elin is ready. Fantastic. Okay, section three of the, pan the pandemic preparedness and response um, is going to be, we're going to address here firstly, the role of private organizations in a pandemic having a strategy to respond to the pandemic, the importance of business continuity in pandemics, uh, adapting the policies for pandemic response, business continuity plans, and, te and testing the pandemic plan. Now, if you're looking at, at this, it is actually speaking all about um, how can you still deliver the critical products and services that your company has to, has to offer. So the role of private organizations in in a pandemic. During a pandemic, governments and public health institutions will serve as the first line of defense. And, and I think we have, we have seen that. The first line of defense are the, are the people that is, um, that is working in the hospitals, people that is working um, the police. We have seen the firefighters. We've seen all the emergency services uh, is the first line of defense. But the second line of the first line, I, I, I don't want to to contradict myself, is the, mobili the mobilization of the communities. Because communities and nonprofits, etc., has got a huge role to, to fulfill in your environments. And this is where we are looking at who's the organizations um, in, in, in understanding your context of the organization. It is not only the external impact, it's also your subcontractors, your stakeholders, and everybody that, that is actually involved there that we need to incorporate there. However, during this time, the resources can be overstretched, which could, which could diminish the ability to manage the situation. And this is why the private organizations, nonprofits, et cetera, is so important. Private organizations can play an important role by supporting governments and public health institutions. Actions that, that can be taken include, but not limited to, equipping employees with protective equipment, raising awareness and advocating protective um, measures, providing resources such as um, supplies, funds, or expertise, helping the, the surrounding communities and preventing the spread of misinformation. Now, if you look at, the, at, at that, that role here, if we're looking at, um, in Botswana, I, I know that, that some of the hotels has actually opened up um, the hotel facilities for quarantining of, of people for free, for free gratis. It, um, and the only thing that people need, need to pay there was actually for the food. So they have actually make, made use of the facility that is standing open with the people not doing anything that they have actually utilized that in, in, a, in a different way. If we're looking at, and I said to my wife yesterday, they, there was um, big clothing, clothing companies that, that is um, and internationally recognized clothing companies that, um, that, that is uh, like uh, body armor or what's it, under armor and those guys that has actually started with, with, with um, 
um, with kind of jackets for the emergency services or for people that's actually working in, in, in the medical field. And those, those, those are actually opportunities that has been seized by those companies. By giving things away now, they are actually creating for themselves a new market because if the, the nurses and the doctors and, and the employees in the first line of defense are going to like this, it is going to be part of, of the uniform going forward. So you are actually opening up for you a different line. Um, if you're looking at, at, um, at Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg has actually um, said two weeks, two weeks ago that he's, he, he's, his offices in Silicon Valley in California, he's going to be, to be closing uh, to, to decrease um, uh, that those offices with 50% of personnel. Um, and he is going to put in a rule that nobody can stay um, more than two hours away from that office if they are working there. Because he's now looking at, firstly, how can he save money? Secondly, how can he inject those, those money into, into the pandemic and to support government? How can he work with um, the, the environmental impact? How can he actually source a bigger pool of knowledge globally, because those 50% of people that is not going to be working there anymore, he still has to have them. But he is saying that if I'm looking at only um, around Silicon Valley, he has got limited exposure and limited, um, um, I want to say, um, expertise there. Whereas if he is throwing this thing out globally, because all of us are now working from home, this is our new part, um, buzzword, he can do exactly the same and have the best programmer sitting in Sweden that is that's far away from from um, I want to say America but also he's not very clever because he has looked at what is the, the different time zones and from America if he has to have a 24-7 um, operational room he has to man that he has to pay overtime for those people those people needs to needs to work in shift he's actually um, stopping that totally and now he's got resources across the world that he can appoint from Singapore to Europe um, to to the Americas and now he, he doesn't have to have those intricate um, resource management systems anymore um, so if you're looking at if you're looking looking at what can organizations do in such a crisis so whether public or private, organizations have to, con to continue to produce their, their products and provide their services while keeping in mind the health and safety of the employees. Extremely important because this is now touching on the Occupational Health and Safety Act in every country. Numerous organizations have been impacted by, COVID by the COVID-19 outbreak, either because they operate in China or because they directly or indirectly work with Chinese organizations. So this is back to clients and suppliers, what I've, I've spoken about earlier. A majority of these organizations have already activated their business continuity plans or similar ones. Moreover, such organizations should also take into account the potential psychological and psychosocial effect that such, such outbreaks could cause. Therefore, if you look at the, con the concrete steps should be taken to minimize negative impacts is the prevention of discrimination against Chinese workers or as potential fears um, could arise around possible infectious cases. Secondly, tele teleworking should be encouraged and established. Elian, just make a note for us. Um, we, can, we can put out um, teleworking um, as, a, as a free course um, to our alumni. Okay, uh, Mpo, do you like that one? It's a freebie. And then I, my friend, your hand is, I know that you are by, by heart um, white, but your hand doesn't look like that. Sorry, I'm not joking. Medical screening, surveillance, care, and psychological support should be provided by organizations. And this is where the obligation of organizations is critical and Kubus, where you are working in 
in, in, in a mining environment firstly, but secondly, where you are actually working with PP, PPE um, and the supply of this. This is coming back to actually the Occupation Health and, and Safety Act. This is actually, if you're looking, looking at point number three, this is not only compliant with the legal environment, it is actually also a duty of care. So, um, Ilian, just make a make make a note for us. They, I will send out um, an article on duty of care that we've got from from um, a legal um, organisation. Follow up of workers can also be done regularly through telemedicine by the designated health services, which would also further reduce in-person contact. That's beautiful telemedicine. We haven't done that as yet here. Training and, and information sessions about the responsibility of each employee in preventing the spread of the disease should be provided by health practitioners. This could include topics such as basic hygiene practices, mask usage, etc. I've been seeing this mask usage on, on, on the TV and um, I've heard on, on Sunday on CNN, they were speaking about the disease, COVID-19, the droplets are actually, they are seeing your mouth and your nose as a five-star hotel. So if your mouth, mouth and nose are open, you are actually creating an, an environment for, for that virus to actually go and, and, and chase after a room in your five-star hotel. So you are creating a five-star hotel there. So the mask usage is so critical. And then upon returning to work, specific support should be provided. This should include an assessment of eligibility for employment uh, injury benefits. Um, these recommendations ought to be included in the Occupational Health and Safety Risk Assessment Framework. Now, very important this one, because companies, companies that are not having um, uh, plans to, to go back to work, how can they conduct a risk assessment? A risk assessment needs to be conducted against the legal framework that has been put out by the different governments. And that legal framework is actually your permit to actually work. If you don't comply with that specific, specific um, um, regulatory um, requirements, you cannot be allowed to work. So having a strategy to respond to pandemics, We've been speaking, myself and Andy Lian, we, we've been speaking for the last year about um, a formula that we've got, that, that, we, that we are putting out there, and we are calling it P square, S, T square. Now, P square is, is two P's, S and two T's. So we are, we are speaking about what is your strategy in terms of your people? What is your strategy in terms of your processes? What is your strategy in terms of, um, of systems? What is your strategy in terms of your tools that you've got, like a thermometer, etc.? cetera? What is your um, um, face masks, etc.? What is your strategy in terms of technology? Now, technology is critical because um, if you are working with mass um, people, then to go and, 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 and measure each person at, at a gate is going to be so time consuming that they will be three hours into the 12 hour shift um, and they are not yet at work. So if you're looking at that P square S T square, that is actually a, a, a very critical management control mechanism or a formula that we can that we can use for this. So for an example here, an organization pandemic strategy. So the ABC organization's pandemic emergency plan is, is designed with the intention to prevent the potential spread of diseases within the organization. This plan is initiated in case when the public health authorities declare a pandemic emergency. Nobody of us has even looked at, at this kind of thing. I was, I was um, myself and Elian um, um, had, had a, a, a consultation session and a, um, a board risk assessment in October and January, uh, October of last year and January of this year with the Civil Aviation Authority. And uh, um, pandemics, be, because um, COVID was already out then, 
in China and it was actually starting to be spreading and we were putting pandemic on, on, on the risk register to be evaluated. And at that time, people, the board was saying, no, 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 this is just like SARS and, and all the others, it is not going to be, to come to us. We are too far away from China. And now at the moment, the Civil Aviation Authority is dependent on flights, on not on flights, on people sitting in seats on flights because each person is charged with the safety charge. The moment that they are landing, that money needs to be paid over to the Civil Aviation Authority. So if you go back to the three slides pre previously, your revenue stream income, they've got only one, one stream of income, 85% of their business is about safety charges. Now, with no, no planes flying, firstly, and secondly, no tourism, um, they are sitting in a bit of trouble. So the plan includes a suspension on the limitations regarding sick leave days with the intention of making employee, uh, employee, employee health a priority. Moreover, employees are encouraged to stay home and support sick family members. The plan requires that, that all areas where employees are in the close vicinity of, of customers or vendors are thoroughly sanitized on a daily basis. And this is where we are actually sitting with, um, Paul, I, 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 am, I am looking to you here, where um, your safety inductions, the safety inductions that, that, is, that is done at um, uh, Juanin, um, we, we have been, myself and Eliane, has been sitting there in, in, that, in, a, in a small room um, with about 60, 70 people. Um, and the question is, can't that be done online now? We've got so, so many online strategies that we can, and uh, most of your people that is actually, actually going, going there uh, is coming from Johannesburg in this environment here. So um, we need to be, to be looking at how can we actually do that kind of, that kind of, um, of, of training electronically that people can, can come to our facilities or, or that, that, that we've got, we've got a, a great partner um, with, with uh, Northwest University that we can roll out a learning management system specifically for health and safety environments at a fraction of the price and that they've got a permit then the same as what the government is giving that they can actually come to your business. And then additionally, every employee ought to be provided personal sanitation gloves and face mask. This is not all. We have to be in a space where, where people need to clean surfaces. We need to be in a space where people are, are looking at, um, at, at, um, at kind of cubicles. Um, I have seen an interview on card launch on, on Sunday where a face-to-face -face interview was, was done without masks, but there was a screen placed between them um, that, that, that no droplets could actually go through the screen. And then moreover, all employees returning from a business trip to an infected area will have to telework from home via a VPN for seven days before they are allowed to enter the office. And this is, this is going to be the future. If we are coming um, from until there's a vaccination, if we are coming from an infectious place, like in South Africa compared to Botswana, our numbers in Paul is, is now at the moment, I think at 70,000 billion, is it correct? It's around there, isn't it? Um, in Botswana, we, you, you are sitting with very low numbers. So every, guy that is that is going into or sorry every person that's going into your environment need to be quarantined because you don't know if that person is sick or not now who's going to pay for that two weeks or the seven days of quarantine because um i cannot go and do work there you cannot come and do work here if if, if you are for 14 days um quarantined on this side and when you go back to botswana you are you are again quarantined it is, it is just not going to be a viable solution, that one. So teleworking and this kind of, of working is going to be, um, I want to say, the future until we are getting a vaccination. The importance of 
pandemic planning. In order to reduce the impact of a pandemic on business operations, workers, customers, and the general public, it is crucial that organizations develop the business continuity planning for a pandemic as soon as possible. Now, this is for us an opportunity. So, um, and if, if I'm looking at, um, at, at our structure, we need to be doing that. Just make, make for us the note to the end, will you? A business continuity planning for, for a pandemic. Um, secondly, organizations that lack business continuity planning could face numerous dif difficulties. In such case, em employers would um, attempt to address pandemic challenges with insufficient or inadequate resources. Back again to your resources. What is your risk bearing capacity? And risk bearing capacity, I have, we, we have seen it now from, from various environments. Risk, risk bearing capacity is, is actually not only looking at the salaries that you have to pay. Every supplier that you need to pay that is on your books, you need to comply with that stakeholder agreement because there's a service level agreement and that service level agreement is actually um, implemented with a, with a purpose of making sure that both parties are, are protected. Um, whereas employees would be left without proper training, thus being unable to carry out their work. And the, and the, the third dot is appropriate and timely planning. However, um, would allow employers to, to better protect their employees and at the same time prepare organizations for the potential changing patterns of business disruption that, that could occur in the supply chain. The supply chain is going to be the biggest critical environment in the future. Now, in, in, that, in that space, you are going to look at, you will be looking at in your, in your vendors, who is getting the stock from one pool of environments like China. You are going to be sitting with, 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 a, with, with, a, different, with a different view of what are you going to have on your books as suppliers? Is it, um, is it coming from all from one pool or not? Now, this is a very nice uh, business continuity pandemic illustration of uh, the gradual disruption um, of within a pandemic. Now, if you, if you look at this, firstly, we've got the X and, and the Y um, Excel, the, the, the capacity of operations, um, and then the time that, that you've got to actually work with that. So if you're looking at firstly on the, the timeline, there's a warning, there's an incident, there's a, re um, a recovery time objective, RTO, and then we've got a, a time at which impacts become, become unacceptable. And in some, in some cases, it is, it is possibly uh, within two weeks. Other cases, it is, it is maybe in a month, in six weeks, eight weeks, et cetera. And then every mitigation that you are actually putting, putting in there, from the top there, the resumption of activities at acceptable levels, um, capacity within acceptable timeframes, can you do that or can't you do that? Mitigating and responding to and managing the impact. How do you manage that? How do you send people home if, you, if, 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 if the country or the environment that, that they are living in, let's say in, in South Africa, um, some, some, of, some of our clients, most of the, of the employees are, are actually staying either in Tembisa, in Fosleris, in Mamalodi, um, in Kailicha, etc., and the the inter the internet connectivity, they is not in such a way that a person can actually go through a VPN onto your business and do business from home. So now you are sitting with a resource that you cannot utilize. And then, um, if there's if your RTO, um, the RTO is in business continuity a very important abbreviation. Uh, the recovery time objective. Um, so, so your recovery time objective and your recovery point objective, um, your RPO is actually um, two languages that you you would you would say that if if we've got if we've got from the time of the incident we've got possibly two to three hours that that we can be off offline, um, and then 
we can resume business now again. But if you're talking about the recovery point objective, it is, it is a different methodology because then you are looking at how much data are you losing. If you are going to be off for an half an hour and you are um, First National Bank or EFSA Bank or um, Medbank or one of these big banks, how many transactions did you lose in an half an hour? If you are sitting with, with, with 10,000 um, transactions a second, how many transactions did you lose in that, that 30 minutes? That, that recovery point objective needs to be uh, evaluated and determined, can we afford that or not? Then you shortened um, disruption. And then if we're looking on the right-hand side, um, wh what, was, what is the, um, the system with business continuity implementation, without business continuity implementation, and what is your minimum acceptable capacity? They're calling that um, in, in business continuity, M the MAC. What is, your, what, what is your minimum acceptable capacity that you can actually work with. Now, all these, this whole diagram, this whole, this whole flow chart is actually very important because this gives you a, a very interesting environment that you need to be saying, how can we shorten the recovery time objective? How can we quicker implement mitigating and response um, and having less, less impact? How can we resume um, our activities um, after the mitigation has been implemented and make it shorter. That your, that your timelines, that you've got the vertical lines that you've got here is actually shortened by this whole, by your preparedness. So, pan, so a pandemic emergency manager, very important. Who is going to be that? Usually that is, is either your health and safety person or somebody that is appointed um, by business. Pandemics are considered to be a special type of emergency, mostly because of the rather wide ranging and long standing nature. Therefore, it is the pandemic emergency manager's duty to educate em employees on the potential problems that could arise as, as a result of the outbreak. And furthermore, they ought to coordinate the, um, the authoring of plans which minimize contact be between employees, vendors, and customers. And it's also the pandemic emergency manager's responsibility to apply their medical knowledge in order to lead the organization through an uh, extended medical emergency. Moreover, organization's um, policies need to be adopted and extensive sanitation measures um, applied. So the, the um, just want to, another important thing to keep in mind in, in the planning for this is that, uh, is that some, of, some of the tasks could be establish and update uh, employee policies and procedures related to an influenza pandemic, establish a system which helps monitor employees that are sick or sus suspected to be sick in the event of a pandemic. And this is where, where we're looking at, at the tracing um, uh, the contact tracing of people as well. Ensure that the doctor or family has been notified and that someone is able to take care of them and set up uh, a process which would facilitate the return of workers at the, at the workplace once they are healthy or their quarantine time has come to an end and make sure that the, that the workspaces are equipped with appropriate supplies of tissues and hygiene and cleaning products beforehand. Um, and these may become difficult to purchase once a pandemic, a pandemic has broken out. And you can see these things are current. It is, it is um, uh, published on the 23rd of March, 2020. So, so, so this is actually, I'm so excited about this, this course because this, this course is actually, I want to say it is so applicable on the time period that we are in now. Work, workplace coordination. We've got 15 minutes left. I want to see if we can get to page 50 because um, then we are half, halfway through um, the, the course and then we can do um, the rest of, of uh, the pages um, next week. 
During the SARS pandemic in 2004, the International Labour Organization published guidelines for workplace coordination that suggested the creation of occupational health and safety committees in order to coordinate the, prevent, the, the preventive uh, efforts with regard to the pandemic. The coordination efforts should include issues related to, firstly, applying national laws, policies, and guidelines. Secondly, revising relevant health and safety provisions within the workplace. Thirdly, creating a catalog of workplace areas um, which lack the necessary provision against the pandemics. Um, outlining action plans to amend these deficiencies. Ensuring proper communication with all employees regarding the policies, guidelines, and action plans. Establishing a system which continually assesses the, uh, and monitors the effectiveness of the measures against the pandemic and establishing an accessible um, procedure for employees to express their ideas, questions, or concerns related to the pandemic to the employer or person in charge. And that is just the role of, a, I want to say, a simple workplace health and safety forum. Adapt policies for pandemic response. First thing, establish or update employee policies on flexible work schedules, telecommuting, overseas travel, um, absenteeism, um, and extended medical leave. If, if you've got COVID-19 and you got it from your work, it is actually an injury on duty. Um, recall of employees based on affected areas, voluntary quarantine or isolation and public health recommendations and identifying of key organizational functions is first on the left hand side determine the people and resources needed for the organization to function and the question is what jobs are needed to carry out the daily activities this is back again to business continuity where we are saying what is the critical people what is the critical processes what is the critical assets what is the critical um, stock everything that is critical to make your core business um, proceed with the business in delivering um, products and services. Who are the organization's key partners, suppliers, and subcontractors? This is back again to understanding the context. What is my key partners? Who is my key suppliers? Who is my key subcontractors and contractors? And what key materials does the organization need to, um, to function with? So if you are looking at, at these, these kind of things, I can guarantee you, you can, you can sit with your, with, with, with your list of, of, of people assets, of process assets, of system assets, of um, tools assets, um, et cetera, that P square is T square. And out of that, you can easily go and determine, is that critical or not, or not? Is that process critical or not? Is that person critical or not? Or go back to your business impact analysis that you have conducted, and, and I can guarantee you, if business impact analysis are conducted now at the moment, um, again, in view of COVID-19, I can guarantee you the business impact analysis is going to be different. On the right-hand side, consider how the organization will need to adjust when resources are constrained. And this is now, now again, whether it is salaries, whether it is, um, because some, in, in, in some cases um, with enforced environment, there is certain contracts that you, that you just cannot um, not pay because the impact of that on your on your on your total business is going to be so critical that um, that you that 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 you that it's going to be so long such a long long term effect that you have to make a balance a balance decision and a scientific decision about who do we pay and who don't we pay and. So under, under that one, how can organizations fill positions if employees are absent? Secondly, how can organization accomplish critical tasks if its key partners are unavailable? And how can the organization adapt if its supply chain is interrupted? Now, the last one is critical because your supply chain is not only about masks or um, um, PPE things that you need to have. This is also for your business to deliver your product and your services. If you're looking at, 
at EDGAS. Ed, EDGAS in South Africa is one of the biggest groups, I think, in Botswana as well. EDCON has filed for liquidation three weeks, three weeks into, into COVID. Such a big organization, but this is back again too. I need to make a decision on which resources am I going to be paying or not. And the landlords in all the places where they have got uh, um, um, space or rental space, didn't give them any relaxation on the payment of their rent. So immediately um, the, the, the environments are closed. Uh, the shops are closed. They're doing no business. There's, there's no revenue stream, firstly. Second, secondly, they're sitting with personnel overheads. They're sitting with contractual overheads. They're sitting with clothes that they have bought already that is, that, that is coming into the country. So they, they just couldn't, couldn't do any, any of those. So essential services function response priority list. This is a very important um, document that we are speaking about here. What is your, your, your essential services or your functions or, um, or your response priority list? And this is coming back again to your, to your vendors, to your persons, your, 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 your processes, everything there. So firstly, what is your priority? And you can also have the um, a severity analysis, um, a likelihood analysis. We, we, can, we, can, we can do anything. We can have um, a criteria of measurement in any way that, that we can actually do this. So firstly, the priority. What is the, the priority? Secondly, what is your service and your functions? Thirdly, what is your current number of, of employees? Fourthly, what is the number, the number of minimum employees required for the service? You see, immediately you are making decisions here about what is my critical employees for the critical function, for the critical output of the services or the products. And then what is your search increase potential? Is it yes or no? If there's a search in, in the uptake, I'm, I'm talking about uh, a chemical environment that is actually making disinfectants. Um, how can you actually work with that, with that search? How can you adapt to that search? And then work performed at home. Can they do it at home or not? And this is where you've got a total analysis of everything that you need to do to actually look at what is your stakeholder analysis? What is your vendor analysis? What's your, your, your contractor, your subcontractor analysis and everything that is included there. So the business recovery team and, and other essential employees. Also the example here, who is my business recovery team? So firstly, my name and surname, position, my contact details, my services, um, this, the service that I'm supporting, what is my, my um, alternative contact and what is my contact on on the phone uh, my phone number email how can you get hold of me when you need me and um, just sustaining ess essential employees the steps that could be taken in this regard is firstly evaluate the and and propose a pandemic response policy and accompanying steps which would protect and sustain all employees the family members, customers, um, clients, and the public, and establish a more specific plan which would cover the essential employees, just essential services. Monitor and encourage employee uh, annual influenza vaccinations, um, educate and train new employees, establish policies which would restrict travel to, to or, um, or work from affected domestic or international areas, Ensure that these policies and procedures are tested and train uh, managers and workers about them. Then identify key workers who are dual income working parents, um, those who, who are single and those that are heads of, of households. Very important because now you are looking here after your employees. You are looking here after um, what, what is, um, if, if there's, a source of income for somebody else, then you can start splitting your resources. Identify the number of workers with school-aged children or other dependents at home. Review and identify the number of employees and their families who rely solely on public transportation because that is a big risk. 
uh, consider whether or not uh, there, there's an availability of social and community service support. I just want to go back to the previous one. My my sister is uh, is working for the 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 World um, Food Organization, also also part of the WHO. So they are they are making sure that that food is is um, uh, coming from South Africa and and it has been sent to to Zimbabwe, Mozambique, Zambia, and those places. And they 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 were. Um, They've got company cars, etc. With the pandemic, when 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 that started, they took all the company cars back. They gave it back to to Avis. They didn't own it. They were renting it, so they gave it back to Avis. So now the now the question is, if the business is going to open, each of them needs to have a declaration to say that they did not use public transport. So now. With 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 the car that you are being being given, uh, now suddenly you don't have it. You are going to use an an Uber, a taxi, etc. And the moment that you are doing that, you cannot enter the offices. So working from home is a, is 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 critical. And all these things that we are mentioning here are very critical. Consider we, whether or not there is an availability of social and community service support. Establish a plan. Or potential grief counseling and psychological care because people are scared and afraid. Establish a plan which identifies medical support actions to be taken with regard to protecting employees and their families. And we're talking here about steps on collaborating with insurers, health plans, and health care facilities. I know with the heart train, what we've got there is that um, uh, there's, there's, a, um, there's a clinic. Um, on site, so people can go there, so they can be be tested each and every day. Planning for the relocation of of staff. So if you're looking at, at that, in case when an organisation plans for its employees to work from home during a pandemic, the following aspects should be considered: firstly, transportation of equipment. How can that be done? Accommodation. Do they have the necessary infrastructure? To actually work from home, personal and family commitments. Uh, this is about children. When the pandemic was actually announced and the schools closed, um, it was not yet said that that the businesses was closing. So what was the what what were parents doing with the children that is that is still in the creches, uh, that is that is still in the primary school? They need to have somebody else to be looking after those children. Otherwise, the mother is also staying at home or the father. And then working from home challenges. Working from home challenges is now 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 suddenly I must look after my children. I must I must look after my house where where I had a domestic worker. I cannot do that anymore. Do I have internet? Do I have, have access? Do I have a laptop even? Um, do I can I really work from home or not? Am I equipped to do that? So your business continuity plan is a documented information that guides an organization to respond to a disruption and resume, recover and restore the delivery of products and services consistent with its business continuity objectives. Now, this is critical because if you are saying that you are delivering, let's say liquor, that you are delivering 10 cases of this specific liquor to, to choppies or, or to checkers liquor, liquor store and you cannot do that anymore because your business has, has got interruptions. The space that you've got at choppies and at checkers liquor, you are going to 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 um, to lose. Um, so um, and and then another um, uh, man, man, manufacturer are going to be using that. So based on the definition, the business continu continuity plan should be kept as a writing as a written document and provide the necessary information and guidance to help an organization respond to and recover from a disruption. Guys, I see that that, that it is 11 o'clock. Uh, I just want to ask, we've got four pages to do. Can we, can we proceed, if it's okay with you? Just a, a thumbs up, if you, if you can. Elian, you are okay. Kubis?
Uh, Nico, um, you, uh, your, your um, sound disappeared for a while. Currently, I cannot see you at all. I just see a black screen, but I can hear you. So maybe if we can just hear from the others as well. Hello, I can't see. Okay. Hey. Can we see? You, you can see me as well as you, you can see the slides. Oh, I can see everything, yes. Okay. I can, okay. I can see the slides, but I can't see your face. It's just a black screen. I think, Mpo, your sound is back. Is that correct? Okay, I, I don't know. Okay, I'm, I am going, going to stop my, my video that, 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 we, that we are um, yes. looking without that. So I'm just going to go on with this last four pages, if it's okay with you, Gubis, are you right with that? You can hear me. I can hear you. Thank Everything you, Eileen. Sounds good. Thank you. Um, okay, so, so what do business continuity plans contain? So firstly, if you're looking at clause 8442 in ISO 2301, collectively the business continuity plan shall contain, firstly, details of the actions that the teams will take in order to continue or recover prioritized activities within predetermined time frames, monitor the impact of the disruption um, and the organization's response to it, B, reference to the predefined threshold and process for activating the response, C, procedures to enable the delivery of products and services at agreed um, capacity. D, details to manage the immediate consequences of a disruption given due regard to the welfare of individuals, the prevention of further loss or, um, or unavailability of prioritized activities and the impact on the environment. And the business continuity plans um, each plan shall include the purpose and scope of the objectives, B, the role and responsibilities of the team that will implement the plans, actions to implement the, the solutions, um, supporting information needed to activate, operate, coordinate, and communicate the team's um, actions. Then E is internal and external interdependencies, very critical, and this is coming back again to understanding the organization. F, the resources, the resource requirements, G, the reporting requirements, and H, a process for, for standing down. And then defining the format and structure of the business continuity plans. The recommendations here is the structure of the BCP should be customized to meet the specific needs of the organization. There's no one size fits all. Even though it is not mandatory to use one particular BCP structure, it is recommended that the standard BCP format be adopted to enable consistent applications across the organization. Experience and good practice shows that a BCP should be modular in design with different cons uh, consecutive numbered sections, and then the different sections of the BCP uh, provide an opportunity to form separate documents that is module sections of subplans that can be given to individuals or teams on a need to know basis. So how to draft the business continuity plan? It's firstly, purpose and scope. Secondly, your objectives. Thirdly, activation um, criteria and procedures. Four, implement, implementation procedure. Five, roles and responsibilities. Communication procedure. Six, seven, internal and external interdependencies and interactions. Eight, resource requirements and nine information flows and documentation processes. And the business continuity plan content. So firstly, your, your plan overview is your introduction, your purpose of the plan, your scope, your objectives, assumptions, plan ownership, event lock and decision lock, accountability, responsibilities and authority, site business continuity managers, business unit managers, et cetera. Notification, invocation, um, and escalation. Um, notification process or flowchart, invocation process or flowchart, escalation process or flowchart, call out list like call trees, uh, including a reverse cascade um, process or flowchart, 
you audit your BCM team number four. So it's your team membership, location of your contact details on your BCM command centers, map of your BCM command center locations, command center locations, then your contacts, inter, uh, internal personnel, external contacts, including subject experts. And then we are speaking here about task checklist and memorandums where you've got mandatory task, discretionary task and task completion tracking processes. And we can, we are continuing uh, on point number seven, staff injuries and fatalities, your support information, staff welfare and, and counseling, media and public relations, health and safety, emergency services liaison, uh, finance, legal advice, suppliers, insurance, etc. Critical business activities is a schedule for of critical business activities or support activities, recovering recovery action plans, BCM resource recovery profile, and the BCM um, recovery profile. And then your recovery site location is your invocation process or flowchart, the recovery site floor plan layout, the recovery site location map, location of staff, security and emails, and then you, your recovery resource profile, the standard workstations and everything that you need there. And this is every, every um, resource that you need there. Your templates is your meeting agenda, your internal briefing, decision and action log, your task list status report, telephone message, action or task worksheet, and then appendixes is your contracts and service level agreements. So, and why evaluate the business continuity plan? So if you're looking at this, it is firstly to ensure that all aspects of the business are covered, improve your business recovery procedures and provide the adequate completeness and accuracy of the, the recovery, the current recovery plans. And then your testing the pandemic plan. Testing is critical because your pandemic plans are usually tested through laptop exercises or desktop exercises. And the main focus is to safeguard the well-being of people by preventing the spread of, in, of infections. And it is important that the pandemic plan is periodically tested and reviewed. And by testing it, you can see what is the gap analysis there. You can see what needs to be implemented and what needs to be um, um, completed there. And this brings us to the end of this section. So the next section, I just want to get the next section is section, um, I think four. Come on quiz, you've got section four. So we will be um, starting on page 59 next week. Um, now I want to ask, is there any, any questions that we can, that we can answer for you? From my side, nothing, Nico. Um, it seems like Mpo lost sound um, yeah. about at slide 40. So I just said to him that we will make sure that he gets a copy of the training material. Yes. Yes, yes. Thanks, Elian. Mpo, I see that you are, that you are still here with us. I don't know. Mpo, can you hear me? No, it seems like he can't hear us at all. Um, okay. So he did yeah. send me, did you see the, the chat? Yes, I see that. Thank you. Thank you, Elian. Um, Kubis, any, any questions from your side? Any input? Oh, fine from our side. Thank you very much, you guys. Very useful, very lot of information. Thank you. I want to ask you, what did you learn? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's something that hit us without warning us. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. Gillian, what, what did and you learn? I think, um, Nico, I, I, what I've learned is, uh, um, is that, that number one, we, no one in the world were prepared for something like this. Absolutely. And um, that whether it's going to happen again or not, we need to make sure that we are prepared if, it, if something like this happens again. Absolutely. Agree, but, but you see, it is happening already because last night I, I watched an article on Bloomberg mm -hmm. and they're saying 
the second wave is already starting in China. China is just not advertising it. They not they not spreading the word. So I think we must really think about the second wave. It's it's coming. It's definitely there. Yes, agree with you. As as well as 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 you have seen, I think in in America the second wave when they are opening when they have opened now, they have um, on on Sunday morning they were saying that uh, also with the demonstrations they were sitting with twenty five thousand new cases. We New York is now is now looked after. It's not a problem, yeah, but but all the other places now California has got the biggest spike in it. Um, where people are actually on the beaches, they are swimming, swimming there. So social distancing is gone. It is and not the even thing there is, anymore. With our schools that's going to, well, that is open now and going to phased in open in the future, I think it's going to hit us through that as well. Yes. Yes, yes. So, so the, the, the question is actually what, what, what we have seen. Um, and yeah, what we've seen here is actually that the biggest thing is how can you prepare for the pandemic? Because it is there now. You can do nothing about it. We have to wait for um, a vaccine. And, and the question is, are your business continuity plans correct? Are your business continuity plans in order? How can we actually work with business continuity and make this, make this stronger? And I think this is a big opportunity for all of us to, to be looking at um, Elian, all these things are actually in our toolkit, isn't it? Yeah, no, we have most of them. And I've actually, when, I, when we went through this, now there's actually one or two things that we can actually add to that. That's correct. Those, those um, the, the criticality of the processes as well as the, 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 the personnel mm. that is there. Uh, so yes. so those, those things, we've got it already in, in, in the, um, in the in COVID-19 one. That's it in the COVID-19 oh, well, we, Especially if we combine the COVID-19 and the uh, 22301, we should yes. maybe, and if I add now one or two, then, then we should That's be correct. covered with all of that we've done now. That's correct. And I, I, I hear what you're saying there, and I like it. Because COVID-19 on its own is, is, not, is not for me a, uh -uh. a strategy. It needs to be it's, part and parcel of your business continuity preparedness. Yes. It must be part of the pandemic part. That's it. That's it. So I would not, I would not even, even call it COVID-19. I, I, I was actually looking pandemic. at that uh, over the weekend, and I was yes. thinking to change it to, to, do, to, to call it pandemic. Yeah. That's correct. That's because correct. it can be used in any pandemic Absolutely. situation. Absolutely. All right. Okay. So we will send out the invite for the second part of it. So we are going to work from section four um, till we are finished uh, in on 103 on next week. Are we okay with that? 100. Okay, fantastic. Thank you very much. And okay. I'm going to, to stop sharing here and I'm going to, to stop recording uh, as well.